When Donald Trump was elected president in 2016, he deserved a shot. Whether Americans voted for him or not, we needed to give the new chief executive a chance to prove himself worthy, worthy of the title and worthy of the opportunity to lead the greatest nation on earth. But after nearly four years, we know enough to reach a firm conclusion. The president proved himself unworthy of both. What's more, Donald Trump showed us that he is actually a danger to our national security at home and abroad. I don't say this lightly, and I also don't say it as a mere observer. I say it as someone who was appointed to serve under this president and spent more than two years helping run the department that he viewed as among the most important in his administration. My name is Miles Taylor. I've spent my career in the national security community focused on keeping Americans safe. I joined the Trump administration where I eventually became chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security, but I left in 2019 because I could no longer serve this president. I want to tell you why. But first I want to say something to my fellow Republicans, many of whom believe that the seemingly endless criticism of our president is fake news, that it's a fabrication, uh, fabrication of a deep state or a malicious mainstream media. I helped run the third largest department in the federal government, a 250,000 employee, $60 billion a year organization. And I will tell you this, I saw no sign of a deep state dedicated to unseating the president. And when it comes to media coverage, I will admit the Trump administration is not as bad as it's been made out to be. It is worse. It is exactly what we as conservatives have always said government should not be wasteful, arbitrary, tumultuous, unpredictable, and prone to abuses of power. Worst of all, it is failing at its most fundamental responsibility. The most sacred duty of any president is the duty to protect the country from all enemies, foreign and domestic. It requires a man or woman who is even keeled, sober minded, focused and decisive. In my firsthand experience, Donald Trump was none of these. He was erratic, unserious, unfocused, and wildly indecisive. These might be qualities that are okay on the campaign trail, but they aren't qualities that should be displayed behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office of the White House, especially in moments of national crisis. It was also clear to many of us at the most senior levels of this administration that the president was inclined to put his self-interest ahead of the country's interest. For instance, he treated DHS like a political tool meant to help him win re-election rather than the nonpartisan law enforcement agency that it actually is. This was especially true when it came to immigration. Donald Trump is right to care about border security, but his overwhelming obsession with the border and the border wall came at a high cost. It meant the president rarely had time or interest in other pressing threats to the homeland from terrorists and cyber criminals to hostile foreign governments that are trying to divide and destroy our democracy. Trump didn't care. It was the wall or nothing. As a result, DHS was less focused than it otherwise could have been on protecting Americans. And for several years, our commander in chief has been ill-informed about some of the most serious threats to the United States. Our enemies and adversaries know it. They are exploiting that ignorance. And today we are less safe. To make matters worse, the president has frequently ignored our closest allies and embraced those enemies with open arms, trying to cut deals with everyone from Taliban terrorists who harbored the 9-11 hijackers to Kim Jong-un, North Korea's murderous dictator. As a result today, America has fewer friends and far stronger enemies than when Trump became president. But the consequences in our own communities are where Donald Trump's leadership failures are most evident. I remember one day, in 2018, when we tried to brief the president on school safety, on important recommendations for how we should use the powers of the federal government to keep America's school children from being murdered in their own classrooms. The president was disinterested and he changed the subject. He wanted to talk about once again, border. And as we sat there holding on to stories from the families of Sandy Hook and Parkland victims, he told us he wanted to tweak the designs of the border walls so it would be quote, a work of art. It was clear that day what was the bigger priority for Donald Trump. The president also directed us to use the powers of DHS to take actions that would benefit him politically or would hurt his detractors, 
whether it was demands to release illegal aliens on U.S. streets in Democratic-leaning cities or cutting off emergency aid to Americans in states and territories where he was unpopular. In fact, during some of the worst natural disasters in recent memory, we watched as the president routinely politicized the response and was too distracted to provide the leadership the American people needed to recover. We saw it, too, with the president's reaction to nationwide civil unrest this summer. He showed greater interest in deploying DHS to protect the statues of Confederate soldiers than to protect the lives of black Americans who still feel in corners of our country that they are treated differently because of the color of their skin. It shouldn't be this way. The Department of Homeland Security was built from the rubble of 9-11. It was charged with preventing such a day from happening again. So we would never have to watch Americans leap from burning buildings or hear the stories about final phone calls of loved ones aboard hijacked airplanes. If Trump had paid more attention, he would have used DHS the way it was meant to be used, including responding earlier to the coronavirus pandemic. DHS was built for that mission. It was ready for that mission. But because he didn't, our economy went into free fall and our country is in turmoil. Because he didn't, we are experiencing the equivalent of a 9-11 scale attack every week with thousands of Americans dying needlessly from the uncontrolled spread of the virus. And because he didn't, we once again have to hear the stories of loved ones making final phone calls, this time alone, from empty hospital rooms where they will leave this earth without their families by their sides. Four more years of this would be unthinkable. As I've said recently, advisors close to the president have told me they are planning for, quote, shock and awe if he gets reelected. Do you know what they mean by that? They mean they want to implement policies that are so unacceptable and so un-American that they can't implement them now before the president faces voters. If reelected, Trump will feel emboldened, as he hinted with these words earlier this year. When somebody's president of the United States, he said, the authority is total, and that's the way it's got to be. If reelected, the guardrails will be gone. And Trump will try to remake this country in his own image, an image of division over unity and hate over hope. If you doubt it, look no further than how Trump has already recast America from a shining city upon a hill, a beacon of hope to the world, into a land closed off to those striving for freedom, including aspiring immigrants seeking shelter from storms back home. In fact, his animosity towards migrants is so deep that he implored us to turn them away, tear gas them, and even shoot them at our southern border to prevent them from reaching our country. We're not talking about hardened criminals most of the time. In most cases, we're talking about women and children who are fleeing violence and persecution. He told us directly he wanted his wall to have spikes so sharp that they would cut through human flesh and hot black paint that would burn the skin of anyone who touched it. He even asked us if it could be electrified. This is not a man who wants to secure our country. This is a man who has lost his humanity. So let me say this. Donald Trump's character does not reflect the American character. Yet he has managed to divide us, and a lot of damage has been done. So it's time for us to ask, what is needed to repair our republic? First, we face an obvious choice on November 3rd. We are going to be called upon to put country over party. To move on from the Trump era, it will mean electing a Democrat with whom we disagree on many issues, but who is a good man and will be a steady leader. As conservatives, it may be hard, but it's the reset we need. Second, we need to repair the Republican Party itself. We need to go back to our roots and restore the vision that was once the GOP, the party that ended slavery, unleashed the motive power of the American economy, and defended freedom around the world. And third and most importantly, we need to make repairs closer to home. It's not Washington, D.C. that needs to be fixed the most. It's us. And the changes will begin with each and every American. We need to remember that we're neighbors and not political adversaries, that we're all a part of the greatest experiment in human freedom, an experiment that only worked because we had a thriving civil society and communities that held each other up and held each other close. This isn't a job government can do for us. It's a job we have to do for ourselves. Fortunately, past generations of Americans have lit the way. 
On the brink of a civil war that literally split our nation in two, Abraham Lincoln called on Americans not to lose sight of one another. He said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart all over this land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. We should heed his words. Yes, we must return to our founding principles, but first we must return to each other and repair the bonds of affection that make us fellow Americans. Thank you. Let's do this together and may God bless America.